a special day. Okay, I hope you enjoyed James Rowell last week. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we were able to, uh, for you, because of your giving and your generosity, we gave him $40,000. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, that's... Thank you for giving. Obviously, he's very grateful. And, uh, but what a blessing it is that we could do that and to stand with him. He gave us a painting. Uh, he shared that with a group of us. I'm going to try to hold this up, if you can get this on the uh, screen. If you can see it. Can y'all see that well enough? It's called the corner. Let me hold it so it doesn't glare. It's called the corner man. Uh, James paints. He's extremely creative. And he gave this to us because he said, you guys have been in the corner for me. And this is a boxer that he, it, he has all kinds of, I mean, James made this all kinds of, let me get this in the right way. There you go. Am I holding it right? And, uh, but it's called the corner man because really he said, you guys have been in the corner for me, encouraging me, helping me, strengthening me. And really when he gave it to us, and uh, we're going to put this up and we're going to put what he shared about that, because he shares it much more eloquently than, than I really can. But I realize that, you know, this is the truth is, this is what God has called us to do in so many situations. I mean, really what we've done with Care Center, uh, other ministries around here in the Dallas area with our missions, this is really more of what we've, what we've been called to do, be in the corner, support those that are actually out there. So pretty neat. Yeah. We're going to put this in a prominent place so that we can be reminded of, of our role. Isn't that good? Yeah. So I'm going to set this down. <clears throat> but anyway, that's really a blessing for us to be able to, uh, to support James and um, stand there with him during this difficult time for him. So again, thank you for giving. I, I know you saw the, uh, the uh, announcement about our summer series. I just want to encourage you through June and July of each summer, we usually try to do something to equip the saints. And I was thinking about it that, you know, the, the greatest delight that you have in life is when you know you're doing what you were created to do. And I'm telling you folks, we were created to minister. And Luke 4, 18 and 19 that we have on our bulletin is not just some verse we, we picked out to put on there. Not only do we believe it's Jesus' ministry, but we believe it's our ministry too. We were created to be His hands extended to the world around us. Now, we don't have to save the world, we don't have to do that, but those that God puts us in touch with and relates around us, we can be the extension of heaven. To, and we don't have to be, it's not about being professional, it's not about being, we got to know all this stuff. It's just we've got to start stepping out and believing that God would use us, whether it's to speak a word or whether it's to lay hands on somebody, whatever it is, that's what we're going to be talking about this summer. We just want to help us get better equipped so we can really do what we were, what we were created to really do. Amen? So I just encourage you to, to look forward to that. Okay, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 4. I have been talking for some time about the issue of fear. And now last time I shared, I talked about how uh, to receive love. And I want to go back there again and just sort of keep moving this um, into our lives because I think God is really wanting to take us deeper in love because it really is something that displaces the fear. First John chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, I've been talking about this passage for some time, moving back and forth in it, but basically it says that there's no fear in love, and that perfect love casts out fear. Point I've been trying to make all along is that if you've got fear, anxiety, worry, stress, whatever synonym you want to use, the bottom line is that instead of us getting all trying to fight fear, we need to recognize it's an indicator showing that we need a greater revelation of His love. I mean, it's like a flag waving. It's like, 
you know, when fear hits you, maybe it's in finances, maybe it's in health, maybe it's in your emotions, <clears throat> relationships, whatever, but you need to recognize that, wait a minute, when that, when that fear is going off, it's just an indication that you need a greater revelation of His love. You've not been made perfect in love in that particular area. So therefore, fear is there. When you get a revelation of the love of the Father, then it says it literally casts out fear. So we've not been given a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. We've not been given a spirit of bondage again unto fear, but we've been given the spirit of adoption. We cry, Daddy. So I've been moving us along. If you've missed those, I encourage you to go to our isojourn.tv and catch our previous messages. But what I want to do today, I want to take us each week here that I keep sharing this, I want to take us to something that I think will help us to get a greater revelation. I believe His love is crashing over us. It is continuing. He's, there's no end on His love. But what it says here, it's so interesting, in verse 20 it says, if you say, I love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. How can you love your brother whom you've seen and, and love God whom you've not seen? Now that particular statement is uh, six or seven times just in First John. Talking about how we're supposed to love one another. Verse 21 says, and this commandment we have from Him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now we know in our greatest command is love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to, to love our neighbor as ourself. And then Jesus in John 13, actually 34 says, I give to you a new command that you would love one another as I have loved you. So it makes it pretty clear that we're supposed to be loving one another. How did Jesus love us? Well, he gave his life. He laid it down for us. And so I want to make a couple of statements here that I, I really believe are, are absolutely true. Number one, I believe that forgiving our brother is the greatest expression of love. Now, I'm making a jump here, but I, I just want to follow with me. We're supposed to love. It says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. No murderer has life. If you walk in darkness, hating your brother, then you're not walking in the light. This is all in 1 John. And so what God has called us to do is to, to forgive our brother. I think that's the greatest expression of love. I also believe that he has loved us first. That's not an issue. He moved initially to save us and to forgive us. But really what did he do by going to the cross? He, on that cross, he forgave us. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated His love, that while we were still sinners, He died on the cross for us. So what did He do? By His demonstration of love, that was He died on the cross, He gave His life, He forgave us. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So forgiveness is a huge part of what God has done for us. He forgave us uh, our sin, and really He's saying for us to also forgive those who have hurt us. Look at Matthew chapter 6. And we know the Lord's Prayer, that in the Lord's Prayer, that we ask Him to be forgiven as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. But look at verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive men your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Uh, that's pretty clear. You know, that's not, that's not something that, well, if you feel like it, no, it's just real clear. You forgive, you'll be forgiven. Don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So it's a pretty strong issue, and I, and I just, again, I go back, I really believe that the greatest expression of love is forgiveness. It's easy for me to say, I love you. Now last week, we, the last time I shared, I talked about defining love. Not, not defining it as a feeling, defining it as a sacrifice. When Jesus sacrificed His life, God gave us His love. He laid His life down. And so love that we define as sort of a feely kind of a love the love that God is talking about is a totally different, a different level. And what is that practically worked out? It's forgiving one another. That's really what He's called us to do. Look at Matthew 18. I hope all of you, if you've been in church any length of time, would know Matthew 18. Uh, you know, verse 7 says, Offenses must come. Why must offenses come? Well, if we're, never, if we're never offended, how are we ever going to really be conformed to the image of Christ? 
to the level of his forgiveness and grace that he extended. If we're never confronted with that, how are we ever going to be conformed to his image, which is his goal? But I want to pick up in verse 21. And a rather long story, but I think it's important for us to read this. There, this whole chapter 18 is, is very, very important. Peter, in verse 21, came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I don't know if you have it in your footnote. Um, you, there's different uh, varying amounts of what that could be. But let's just say this. It would be in today's terms, if it was gold or silver, it would probably be billions of dollars. So that, that means it, you couldn't pay it. Nobody we know could pay it. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold, his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience upon me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And in that day and time, that could have been possibly a week's wages. So we're talking about potentially billions of dollars compared to really a few hundred dollars. I mean, that's, that's, that Jesus is making a, a major point here. But the servant went out and found his fellow servant, owed him the hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not. He went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So his fellow servants saw what had been done. They were very grieved. And they came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And the master was angry, delivered him to the torturers, until you should pay all that was due him. Verse 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That's a pretty strong passage. Now again, this is Jesus telling this parable, saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. And when I was reading and preparing this, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, you, me, I won't put that on anybody else, still don't see your sin that great. The, the, the amount that he uses here is so out of the ballpark to, to make this huge thing that, he was, that we were forgiven. This is exactly what Jesus has done for us. He has forgiven us a debt that we could not pay. Couldn't pay, no possibility of paying it. There's no way that we could bridge the gap between us and a holy God. Impossible. So we're that servant. We are that servant. There's no way we could, we could pay it. Doesn't matter how much we tried, doesn't matter what we try to do, it is impossible to pay the debt that we owed to join us back to the Father, to be a, a place of release. But we have a tendency to not see it quite like that. And we've been, in, a lot of us have been in church for a long time, and we just, well, you know, saved by grace, thank you, Lord, and we move on. And then we have a tendency to see other people's offenses and, and their irritations and where we get offended, and we see that as even greater. And we want to correct and fix everything and get everybody all right and get mad and upset, when the reality is it's really nothing, zero. Now, I realize some of you have been through a lot of abuse and a lot of things. It's still nothing compared to what God forgave us. And really, we need a revelation of how much we've been forgiven. Because the greater revelation, remember when the, Jesus at the table of the Pharisee, and they're getting ready to eat, and to the a woman who was a sinner came in and began to cry and to, to wipe his feet with her hair and tears. And the, the Pharisee said to himself, if this guy were a prophet, he'd know what manner of woman this is. 
Well, Jesus said to him, he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. He said, one was owed 500 and one owed 50. Give, both were, were completely released of their debt. Which one would love the most? And he goes, well, probably the one released the most. Ah, you got it. He said, this woman, since you didn't wash my feet, you didn't do anything. Since I've been here, she's not ceased to cry and to to wash my feet with their tears, anoint my feet with oil. And her sins, which are many, they're forgiven. That he who is forgiven much loves much. He who is forgiven little loves little. But see, the reality is we've been forgiven much. And so it's not an issue of whether or not we've been, you know, forgiven. No, we've been forgiven a debt we couldn't pay. And I'm just telling you, God wants to give us revelation of really that debt. Because if you understand how much you've been forgiven, it's much easier to be able to forgive those who've offended you. And here's what I, again, this is what I believe. There's no question on God's end. He loved us first. He went to the cross when we were still sinners. His love to us flows like a river. But I'm going to tell you though, if you will release His love to others, you'll get more love. And when we don't forgive and we have relational issues and problems, I'm telling you, it stops up the flow of the love. Because it's a river, not a stream. It's not a pond. We're not a pond, we're a river. Streams of living water are supposed to be flowing out of us. What is that? Love. Love is the greatest force there is. Love never fails. So God is calling us to love, and we're supposed to be releasing love. And I'm just telling you, the greatest expression of love is forgiving one another. Now, let me just uh, talk about some points here about forgiveness, because it is very, very important. Usually, the ones that you're offended with are those closest to you. You know, you get run off the road going to work, and you get upset with that driver, or you, have, you can get upset with different things. But typically, it's family members, those you work with, those that are closest to you. And those are the ones that, that cause the biggest problem. Another issue is that Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. You never feel like forgiving. In fact, feelings, you should not be led by feelings. So those that are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. We're spirit beings. You know, you're not led by feelings. You're led by, by the Spirit and by the Word. But here's the problem. Even though we say it's a choice, I believe, another issue I felt like God showed me, I believe that what you can do, you can mentally forgive, but you've not really forgiven from the heart. Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive from the heart, I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors. So I think we know enough in church to know, oh, I need to forgive. So I choose to, I forgive, I forgive. But we've not really forgiven from here. We've not really released. Because it very clearly says the master released him and forgave him. And what God is wanting for us is that not we just have a mental assent I know I'm supposed to forgive, okay, I forgive. You know, but truly forgive and release them. Now we're going to talk about how to really do that in a moment. But I've just let you let that marinate. Let you just think about that for just a moment. You know, people say, well, how do you know if you're really forgiven? Just ask God. I mean, He's the Holy Spirit. Will tell us if we've really forgiven. And uh, he, he really loves us and He wants us to truly forgive. Now, if you don't forgive someone that's hurt you or offended you, you realize you stay attached to that person? You stay attached to that pain. It's only when you really forgive and release them that you really get free of that. And then, you know, if somebody's offended you, most of the time they have no idea. You know, and they, they're not affected one way or the other. Forgiving is not saying it was okay. I have people tell me all the time, they'll go, well, it's just not right what they did. And I just say, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's not right. You know, and so, you know, what, it doesn't matter. You go, well, it's not right. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. It wasn't. It's really bad. You going to forgive them? I mean, see, we think, it, we think there has to be this right. It has to be just and stuff. No, it's not. What happened to Jesus was not, was not just. I mean, we took him and crucified him. And so... You know, we have this sense that everything's got to be perfect and people should be perfect. Folks, we live in a fallen world. I mean, we, we live in, we, I don't think we realize how fallen it really is. And so, 
you know, people are not going to do what we think they should do or do it the way we think they should do it. And so we, we've got to be able to forgive and not, and it's not saying it was okay. We're not agreeing. We're saying, okay, it was okay what you did. No, we're not saying that. We're just saying that we're choosing to forgive because it really is a choice. People say, well, if it's a violation of, if there's really been hurt and woundedness and, and um, abuse, you don't have to stay in that kind of a situation. No, trust and, and forgiveness are two different issues. But you have to forgive. But trust is something you do earn. So just because you forgive someone, to me, you have to get back in the same abusive situation. Uh, so Because trust really is something that has to be earned. You know, you can't change what happened to you. You can't change the past. You can't change what you did. You can't change anything at all. But I tell you what, you can, if you don't handle it properly, it will keep affecting you each day. And so no matter what happened yesterday, 10 years, 10 years before, 25 years, you can't change that. But if you don't forgive and release and let go of the hurt and the pain, it'll carry on into today and tomorrow. And you'll just keep carrying it, and it'll just keep robbing you. Ten years from now, you'll still be affecting you when really you can be free of that by choosing to forgive. You must forgive yourself. You can't hold forgiveness against yourself. We have a tendency to forgive others, but we don't forgive ourselves because of something we might have done or something we did or something that we, you know, we just feel so bad about. You have to forgive yourself. There's still, forgiveness is complete. You have to give, forgive everybody. And the last thing I would say, because I have people say, well, I just can't forgive so-and-so. can't forgive what they've done. Again, you need a revelation of how much you've been forgiven. But you can forgive. Number one, because you've been forgiven. And number two, the forgiver lives in you. So th there's no excuse for not forgiving. You may say, well, you don't know what they've done to me. And I don't. I realize that. I really don't. I don't realize some of the pain and the heartache some of you have been through. But I just know that Jesus went through a lot of pain and heartache for us. And we can forgive because he forgave us. Now, here's what needs to happen. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. And as we're turning there, uh, our ushers are going to come and get ready for our communion. I really believe that not only do we need to forgive, but we've got to forgive more than just from an intellect and from a more of a a uh, mental ascent. And here, is, I believe, is how we do that. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And it goes on to say that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Okay, here's what I believe if you really want to be free, really free, you have to love your enemies. That means you forgive them. Love in action is forgiveness. Okay? Number two, it says that we are to bless those who curse you. <laughs> Everybody happy? <laughs> now think about, the, you know, think about that. You work situation or home when somebody's really upset with you, we, we're supposed to bless them. And so how do you do that? Well, you just you speak blessings over them. Lord, I bless them. I pray you'd ha they have a great day. I pray the peace of God would be upon them. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them financially and bless them with good relationships. And you're sitting there the whole time thinking, I want to kill them. <laughs> I, I don't want to bless them. I want to bless them all right. I want to bless them with a, with a bat, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But see, if you really, I mean, this is what God is calling us to do. He's literally says, be perfect as he is perfect, and perfect in love. He laid his life down. Now, this is what we're talking about here, laying your life down. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you. How do you do that? I don't know. we just got to pray and ask God to show you what, what can you do to really be, how do you help? How do you be good? Do good. And then it says, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I mean, this is how you move forgiveness from just a mental ascent and you move it into the heart condition. You, how often do you do that? Probably 70 times 7. That means a lot. Not just once, once or twice I'll do that. I'm talking about over 
and over and over until you can get to the point to where you're really blessing and you're really praying for and you really want good for that person. You say, well, what they've not changed has nothing to do with them changing. Has nothing to do with them making, you know, reconciliation or recompense or anything else. It, it's not about that. It's about you. It's about you choosing to release them completely and to bless them and to really speak blessings over them. Now, I didn't say it was easy, but I'm just going to tell you, that's how God moves this down from just a mental ascent deal, oh yeah, I've forgiven so-and-so, to the heart issue where you're really forgiving from your heart. Amen? Yes. Okay, I want to pray for us. And gentlemen, if you'll come and get in position, we're going to take communion. Father, we ask you to help us. Help us to really love the way you loved by giving your life, laying it down. Help us to forgive as you've forgiven us. And I pray, Lord, that if we are holding and still got hurt and pain from people who have hurt us, I pray that this morning that we would truly release one another and bless one another in Jesus' name. Amen.